Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the invite. And um, it's been really great so far and a lot for me to think about. What I'm going to talk to you about is um, some work uh, I've been doing, uh, partly with Phoebe, um, looking at the use of self-tracking devices in workplace wellness programs. Um, and what I'll be suggesting is I'll be looking at self-tracking as a means of capital the capitalist mobilization of productive bodies of the population. Um, it would be my assertion that self-tracking functions as a means for enabling the mobilization of the entire physical, symbolic, and affective lives of the population um, through capital accumulation focusing on encouraging activity. So I'll be seeing activity in, in really broad terms, in both physical terms and in the kind of the production of uh, communicative um, symbols. But I'll um, start with um, just kind of very briefly introducing what it is uh, I'm talking about. So talking about the use of self-tracking devices in workplace wellness programs. So these are any devices really that are used to monitor activity. Uh, it could just be a pedometer, but a in a lot of cases it's, it's Fitbits or similar devices. Uh, this Virgin Pulse one um, is produced by one of the providers of these. Uh, and they're used in initiatives which are designed to improve the health and well-being of employees. Um, so yeah, Virgin Pulse is one of the companies, I think they're mostly, mostly in the United States. Uh, GCC or Global Corporate Challenge is another. And this sort of feedback model is the suggested means in which this works, this functions. They suggest you, you, ha you get a little cue from your device which tracks your steps and, and, and sometimes other things, which could just be that you see your, how many steps you've taken and you think, oh, I should be doing some more, I should be uh, running or walking more. Or it might give you a little um, notification saying that you have walked enough or you haven't walked enough. Um, and then this spurs you on to go out for a run or a walk and then you get a little reward, which could be a virtual trophy or it could be moving up the league table or something like this. Uh, and they have various suggestions as to why they are, why these things are useful, and they're mostly focused around improving the health of the employees, but also improving productivity of the company. Uh, and one thing, which is the most the thing I've kind of focused on most, really, is is this issue of engagement. And I think this is it's a stronger engagement in the middle there, which I think is is more significant than they suggest. Uh, so these are the the kinds of thi um, initiatives uh, that I'm discussing. But I'm going to focus on. Um, draw on this, this quotation from the sociologists Boltanski and Chiapello. And they suggest that activity has become what they call the general equivalent. So activity is the general equ equivalent. It's what the status of persons and things is measured by. It surmounts the oppositions between work and non-work, the stable and the unstable, wage earning and non-wage wage earning class, paid work and voluntary work, that which may be assessed in terms of productivity and that which not, um, not being measurable eludes calculable assessment. And they say that this is becoming increasingly the, the thing which, uh, against which we're always judged. And I think we can kind of see this playing through in what pe some people have called the cult of busyness. Uh, everyone needs to be busy all the time. Everyone has to have a project on the go. Uh, and an increasing preoccupation with individual and state level productivity. The productivity is, is, is a big problem for everyone, apparently. Um, so I place this valorization of activity, which I think we can see in the context in which work is becoming increasingly um, central, I think, to all aspects of our lives, but at the same time that we're, we're, it seems to be declining in the social imaginary. And I think that this is occurring for the reasons which some um, Italian autonomous Marxists have suggested, is because actually work is just moving outside of the factory walls. Really, we're kind of working all the time, not just when we, we kind of clock in and uh, uh, bef uh, before we clock out. Um, so, I'll try to articulate what all this means. Um, and this is happening, I think, for certain due to certain developments within the capitalist structure. Um, and so, Marx's concept of alienation doesn't really stand anymore. Uh, for Marx, he suggested that um, the capitalist production process wouldn't allow workers to be creative or emotionally engaged, so they started to feel kind of like robots. So they were alienated. But in the contemporary economy, it is our emotional and social lives um, which capitalism needs to appropriate, as well as our physical working bodies, in order to generate profit. So emotional labor, social networks, the relationships between people are all central to the productive processes. And I think self-tracking is one means of enabling the appropriation of this, of uh, all, all these different 
aspects for capitalism. So I'm going to suggest two ways in which um, activity has become um, valorized and then self-tracking enables uh, and encourages activity. So the reproduction of productive bodies and the generation of symbolic value, um, data and network connections and, and, and various other things. So the, I've seen these both as types of activity, as physical movement and also the production of kind of, of symbolic things. Um, so first, in terms of productive bodies. Um, so I'll suggest that, well, actually no, I'll just put this quote up. So this is from um, Gray and Delay, um, my French pronunciation is not too good. Um, this is the kind of the mantra for this section. They suggest that the living machine must become as adapted as possible to the social mechanism into which it is in fact integrated, so that its productive act develops in optimal conditions and its gears don't grind too loudly. So, uh, they were talking about mid-20th century psychology and suggesting its place within enabling the integration of individuals into the, into the productive processes of, of capitalism. We don't want their gears to ground too, grind too loudly, we just want them to get on with being productive. Uh, and I think uh, we can see uh, the, the aspects of self-tracking I'm discussing as being part of uh, a similar kind of process. Um, so when I was... Um, Went to speak to, uh, I w went to speak to some people who were involved in implementing these kinds of wellness programs to see why they wanted to do it. Um, and they were all like, super enthusiastic about them. They thought they were great. But they acknowledged that they didn't really think that they actually really made anyone much healthier or improved their, um, uh, improved their wellness in particular. Um, and this is because most people engage with it. Th th there were usually these pro how these projects work is that people get together in teams and track their steps collectively for six weeks or so, compete against other teams in their organisation and elsewhere uh, to see who can walk the furthest distance over that time. So it's kind of like a, a group project. Um, but they suggested that actually, m in most cases, people didn't really um, keep that up for very long, even for the six weeks. Most people kind of their interest dropped off after three or four weeks. And it only really benefited super competitive people who were already kind of running marathons and things like this anyway. Uh, so it's kind of an optimization. But they thought it was great anyway. And it's for these kinds of reasons. Uh, this is a quote from one of my uh, respondents. They said, as well as competing with other teams, they're also competing against themselves. Every day you'll try and walk more steps. You'll try and build a healthier lifestyle and healthier habits. Someone else said, it's about yourself as an individual, you put your goal, it's about setting your goal and then trying to meet that. So it's, it, it's, it's about this kind of internal process of pushing yourself on to do more, be more active, um, rather than necessarily than actually achieving any kind of greater uh, kind of uh, well, um, health, uh, healthiness or um, anything like that. So I suggest this is really actually part of building an, an entrepreneurial self. Um, and I won't go into too much detail about this because I think other people are going to talk about very similar things, actually, from reading other people's papers. Um, but it's about making people more competitive, more driven, um, get, getting them to focus on um, being tenacious, adaptable, restless, always striving to, produ to, to be doing more all the time. Um, but um, in order to build an entrepreneurial self, um, we need to kind of construct a certain kind of subject. And there's a fantastic book by Ulrich Brockling called uh, The Entrepreneurial Self. Um, and he says about how entrepreneurialism is inherently connected, is intimately connected with the notions of empowerment. Um, and we can think we can see these devices and programs as, as means of empowering um, workers I within a certain kind of way. And he suggests in order for empowerment specialists to promote people's potential to self-govern, they must first frame their problems as essentially caused by a lack of self-government. So this certainly involves individualizing, if not the causes of the problem, then the solution. So they need to encourage people to think that the way to being better, healthier, just a generally a better person is, is individual and is, a, is down to a lack of self-government. And I think we can see this in the ways in which many self-tracking devices are also effectively productivity devices, productivity uh, measures. Um, the Withings HealthMate is a, is a self-tracking um, uh, iPhone app. Um, but it's, all, it's, a, it's a steps tracker and life coach, and the two go together. And, and life coaching is, a, is a, a big part of entrepreneurialism as well. Um, you, know, you set your goal, um, log your food, you track your trends, you track and improve. Um, and it's, it's all about these kinds of ideas. And it's the same kind of thing I think that we saw uh, at the beginning with those. It's, it's about individualizing this kind of process of self-improvement by tracking yourself. Um, 
and this I think there's a big alignment between productivity um, uh, and um, and self tracking here. But what I think this is kind of really um, about, in specifically in a workplace context, um, is down to kind of changes in how we're managed at work. Um, and we don't really allow ourselves to be submitted to um, authoritarian uh, bureaucratic controls, or not everyone does, in the same way that we perhaps used to in the past. And this is, where, again, what Boltanski and Cupello sort of suggested um, in their analysis of kind of management strategies that today um, we're controlled by uh, transferring constraints from external organisation uh, mechanisms to people's internal dispositions. So in order to get us to work and work harder and be productive at work, um, we, won't, we won't just be told this. Um, our managers try to get us to internalise these ideas, internalise this kind of entrepreneurial self. Um, so I think that this is very much connected to ideas around engagement at work. Uh, because if we won't be submitted to these very authoritarian controls at work, we have to be encouraged to be productive at work by our, our, our employers. We have to be um, engaged. Um, and in the, the, the management discourse around this, they make intimate connections between engagement and well-being. Um, and the, the, the two go together for them. And what engagement here really is, is about encouraging people to work, to align their own goals with those of the organization. That's what they really mean. Um, so when they talk about employee engagement, which I think is, is central to this, um, they define em employee engagement as, uh, this is in the kind of management literature, being positively present during the performance of work by willingly contributing intellectual effort experiencing positive emotions and meaningful connections to others. That's in regs, I'll come back to that later. And they suggest that an employee's positive emotional attachment to their job and our colleagues and our organization, which profoundly Im influences their willingness to learn and perform at work. This is kind of the holy grail of kind of work management, is to get people to be engaged in this kind of way. So one of the key um, challenges for contemporary management is to enable workers to feel free and autonomous at work but, um, and to see work as a means to achieve their personal goals, but also to attract rather than direct them to aligning these goals with those of the organization. And I suggest that self-tracking is one of the ways in which they do this. I think we can see this play out if I look at some more of the, 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 the interviews that I um, conducted. Um, because uh, the people I spoke to acknowledged that they were only really engaging some of their workers. Um, as one person said, I'd like to think we target these events and activities to different groups that mean kind of like uh, everyone at work, but the participation of ancillary roles was very poor. By that, they mean kind of lower grade workers. Um, so it would be more your sort of mid to higher grade positions. They, the lower grade people, just want to come into work, do their job, get paid, and go home. So they're not interested in these kinds of activities, apparently. Another said, maybe from a fitness point of view, they, the lower grade people, are less important because they're less sedentary. So perhaps we don't need to worry so much that we don't engage them. I'm not sure there's much of an appetite for, uh, but I don't want them to think this doesn't include them, whether they come or not. So the issue um, here is that those kind of lower grade people who just want to come to work and get paid and go home, they're not interested in this kind of thing. Um, it doesn't really speak to them. Um, and I think this is because these are different kinds of notions of engagement. And again, if you look at the management literature, they talk about transactional engagement, which is where people are driven to meet expectations in order to earn a living and progress or emotional engagement, which is a desire to do more for the organization. And they're looking at those at that second kind of engagement, I think. It's the kind of people um, that are higher grade, the kind of more management positions, or possibly like all of us, who we won't be have these, this authoritarian kind of micromanagement. They have to seduce us into doing what they want. Um, so what they acknowledge in these, in these kind of quotations is that these, these initiatives are not really about um, improving people's well-being, as the last um, actually, sorry, I'll now come back to that. Um, uh, as I say in that second quote, not sure as much of an abstract for them, but it, it, it doesn't matter this doesn't include them whether they come or not. This isn't about people taking part in stuff, it's people knowing that it's going on and feeling good about an employer that does these things. So I'll come back to that point. It's about this emotional engagement with your employer. 
And again, from the management literature, they say that employees will also need to be persuaded that engagement has something in it for them. So we need to show more clearly that engagement improves individual health, stress, and well-being. So they need to be workers need to be engaged in a way in which it seems to improve their their well-being, improve their life um, for themselves. Um, so that's uh, one way in which I think um, these programs, these self-tracking um, programs, when they're implemented in the workplace context, are about, I suggest, improving productivity, but making people more kind of more engaged and more productive at work, but in this kind of de detached fashion. But I think they're also about producing symbolic value. Uh, and this is the bit that I've kind of maybe worked out the least, um, the least so I'm, I'm really interested to know what people think about this. But I think this is... Um, Okay, it seems like a side product, but is actually, I think, more central than, than is uh, acknowledged, is the production of symbolic value through these, uh, through these devices. Uh, and I contextualize this in the insight from Franco Berardi. He suggests that now we're in a, 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 a state of semio-capitalism, uh, which takes the mind, language, and creativity as its primary tools for the production of value. In the sphere of digital production, exploitation is, ex is exerted essentially on the semiotic flux produced by human time at work. So all kinds of self-tracking, including the ones, the, the workplace ones I'm talking about, produce um, symbols, data, as people have already talked about, such as these kinds of, these kinds of things. Um, they produce, um, you can maybe generate Strava badges like this and produces data on you. Um, and what these do is they turn exercise activity into something obviously quantified, but also, as um, Lomberg and Franzen have suggested in a, in a great paper that you should read, um, into something communicational. And of course, any kind of exercise activity or human activity could be meaningful and communicational in certain ways. If I go for a run, um, uh, as well as trying to exercise, I might be portraying myself as this healthy, virtuous person. But also, um, in this context, when um, my exercise activity is turned into a number, it becomes directly communicational in a different kind of way. Because all the, the heterogeneous different kinds of um, exercise activities that lots of people um, engage in um, become standardized, and then they can be kind of combined together. They can be compared. Um, we can um, compete with one another. Um, we can communicate with one another in this kind of way. Um, so that's just that digital tracking is productive with certain kinds of meaning. Um, this is, uh, I'll come back to this, but um, that map is from a, a, um, a, a similar one of these projects that was set up by my organization themselves, and it was where we got into teams, we had to collectively try to walk from, from London to Rome uh, over kind of six weeks period. Um, that's a, a, another way in which I think it becomes communication. We all become this, this symbol on a map that we're kind of, that we're moving across, across Europe. Um, but I think that we need to understand this in the context in which, as other people, um, such as uh, Goldharber and Christian Marazzi and Bernard Stiegler, have suggested that we live in an attention economy. Um, and in the kind of um, societies which, um, like the ones that, that I think that, uh, that we all live in, which are dominated by cultural and knowledge-based industries, where cultural production is abundant, the scarce resource is, uh, is actually attention. So I have more playlists on, uh, saved on Spotify than I'm ever going to listen to, more PDFs saved on my Google Drive than I'll ever read, uh, a longer Netflix list than I'll ever look at. Um, the, the, the cultural products aren't scarce, but um, attention is. Um, and in this context, Bernard Stiegler suggests that uh, we've seen an increasing significance of what he calls the programming industries, um, by which he means kind of media, and actually really this is spread out um, into virtually all areas, which are engaged in a form of psychopolitics. Uh, which is that he suggests contemporary power technologies no longer mainly aim at disciplining bodies or regulating life processes, but at controlling and modulating consciousness. Um, and that media technologies, such as these self-tracking devices, are engaged in trying to modulate our consciousness, to uh, direct our attention in certain ways, because it's our attention that's th that is needed. Um, and again, this is related to that notion of engagement and engagement at work. Uh, we can't be kind of um, directly, strictly controlled by management. They have to direct our attention in certain ways, whether that's towards ourselves, to kind of self-discipline ourselves, or, as I'll suggest in a moment, outwards. Um, so this is about, um, for me, about the, 
the kind of capital appropriation of our emotional, our affective lives, our symbolic lives. So just to return to this quotation, as I said, that last point, this isn't about people taking part in stuff, it's people knowing that it's going on and feeling good about an employer that does these things. It's about managing our attention, our emotional uh, and our uh, affective lives. Um, and um, to take another, another quotation from one of my interviews, um, what someone said was, we call it employer brand. So in terms of us, um, in terms of return on investment, it's about improving our employer brand so that we attract people who want to work for the company. So this isn't about, again, it's not about making people healthier or fitter. Um, it's about managing their, uh, the perception, uh, managing the attention um, of their workers so their workers will think, this is a good place to work, this is good. And also they'll be able to attract other good, other good workers as well. Uh, and the advertising for the Virgin Pulse initiative says similar things. You know, it says, show them some love, they'll love you back. Support what gets your employees going, they'll care more about your business. It's about managing the relationship with your employer, employees. Um, and this is in the context in which um, I think there's been a, there's been a change in, in discipline. And as uh, lots of people, uh, Zygmunt Bauman for one, suggested, that the panoptic model of domination is not really kind of hold sway so much necessarily anymore, at least not for, for certain groups of people. So rather than being drilled and disciplined, we're managed, he suggests, like swarms of bees. Um, if you want to manage a swarm of bees, you can't, you, you can't train them in a training camp. You have to attract them to the nice, um, pretty flowers. Um, they, do, they do the same kinds of things. Uh, and this is particularly the case, I think, with social media, I which uh, works off developing a buzz uh, and virality and, and, and this kind of thing. Um, and again, to return to the, the kind of management literature on, in, on engagement, which I think is intimately connected with, with this, um, this is understood as the, the emergence of employee engagement as, a, as, a, as an important thing was described as the realization that there was a huge potential reserve of energy and commitment in organizations which could be released by making meaning for people. And highlighted the fact that people desperately need meaning in their lives and will sacrifice a great deal to institutions that will provide this meaning for them. So this is kind of inherent, this is uh, latent energy in the, po in the population of workers that needs to be harnessed. You harness it by um, generating meaning, or s well, and certain kinds of meaning. Employer brand, for instance. Um, and again, from the management literature, people are seeking something more meaningful and sustainable than engaging with a corporate strategy. Many employees want to engage with social missions beyond the organization. So this is partly the, the, the rationale for kind of corporate social responsibility, but also for these kinds of programs. Um, and that, that social, that, that mission might actually be quite individualized, like with those Virgin Pulse kind of po um, images. It's actually about developing your self-project, becoming happier, healthier, this kind of thing. Um, but this is about another kind of engagement. This is the, the, the point about network connections I was making. So just again, just to return to these quotations where I've highlighted, uh, it's about making meaningful connections to others, and it's about an emotional attachment to your colleagues. So not just emotional attachment to your boss or your organization, but to those around you. And I think that these kind of programs are useful for this as well. So th this is, um, again, from the, 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 the program that was implemented at my, uh, my university. We were very much encouraged to be posting things on Twitter uh, about how far we've walked and what we've been doing. We were, we're, we were provided with a selfie stick so we could take uh, pictures of ourselves, as people have done here, or of their dog wearing sunglasses, things like this. Um, and so this is about, I think, engaging people's attention towards this thing managing the, 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 the flows of attention towards these things. And so partly to think I should be doing that, I should be pushing myself more, but also to manage this emotional relationship. Um, and again, to return to Boltanski and Capello, Capello, they suggest that today um, the ideal, ideal typical figure of uh, contemporary capitalism is connectionist, it's someone who's connected to lots of networks, someone who is connected to lots of people and they know what connections to exploit and which ones to ignore. Um, and as Duguay and Morgan, who are, um, were writing about Boltanski uh, and Kipelo, says it, the network extender is the nodal point of various networks. They're, that's the ideal person, the person who's connected to lots of people, who's got um, 5,000, 10,000, 1 million Twitter followers, whatever else. And I think that this, these are uh, encouraging people to do that. It's encouraging people to connect with others in this kind of way. And again, some of the quotations from uh, uh, my research, one person said, that's why, why they thought it was good. They said, it's the camaraderie, because actually most of the teams are in the same departments. They see them each day. They start bouncing off each other. Someone else said um, about why they wanted to do it. It's a healthy workforce, but it was engagement as well, the whole staff engagement thing. 
the feedback we got from people who did this, aside from some of the competitiveness, was it was more of a real team spirit. There was a buzz in the air around departments with people doing things as a team, speaking to people they wouldn't normally do. It was people making connections. Um, they were becoming, ne um, becoming a connectionist. Um, and so I, I, I just did, a, I, I won't go into much detail on this, but I did a, a very brief kind of basic um, uh, Twitter analysis of the hashtag for this, the, the, this initiative, which is called Beckett Steps, Leeds Beckett University, to see who the most sort of influential um, uh, Twitter user, uh, uh, users of this hashtag were. Uh, it wasn't, there wasn't a vast amount of, um, uh, of use of it, as, as you can see. Um, but the two big ones, which have got their, their, their nose highlighted in red, is Beckett Steps, which is the official Twitter account, and then um, the, the second one at the top in the middle, uh, the, the Dean of the Faculty of Health, who were the most kind of prolific um, tweeters on this hashtag. And as you can see, w uh, just very briefly, w what this formation, this particular formation, this star type formation means is that they were very influential, they were kind of central to the networks, and they, they were directing kind of the, the meaning. They were kind of very powerful in constructing the meaning around what was going on here. Um, and everyone else was, was relatively not um, influential. Um, and again, just uh, the kind of at this point that, that it's, it's, it's around, it's about um, generating meaning um, in certain kinds of ways, and that actually that their health isn't really a very big part of it. I asked them about how they, how they measure well-being, what it kind of means to them. And uh, one of them said, trying to quantify the benefits of wellness programs is a, is a challenge. How you quantify it really is on feedback. So we use a couple of different feedback systems, uh, but the feedback for the, this was overwhelmingly positive for this GCC program. So that's, they thought it was good. The feedback was good, so therefore it was successful. Someone else said, one really good indicator at the moment is, if you look at our staff survey last year, the question was, the organization is interested in my well-being. We got 72%. So 72% of our staffs think that we're interested in their well-being. And as they go on to say, the, the, the national survey for that sector, um, the average was 52.6. So they, they were doing well. Um, so they're managing that emotional relationship. That's, that was a good outcome, not improving kind of um, health. Um, so just to kind of um, end up, what I um, suggest is kind of going on here is a, it's a particular kind of control through encouraging and stimulating activity, both of physical activity, movement, and also of engagement and the, the, the uh, generation of symbolic value on, on social networks and things like this. Um, what is occurring is a, a form of uh, what Mitchell Lazzarotto, drawing on Felix Guattari, uh, suggests is a form of diagra diagrammatic control. She says is something which circumvents representation, consciousness, and language, and initiates a process that exploits the difference between subjection and enslavement. Um, and what he what he means by this is that um, we're we're engaged um, on the level of uh, what he calls asignifying semiotics. So signifying semiotics is is kind of normal kind of language that we find in a in, in a book or something. Asignifying semiotics are things like data and algorithms. Um, and codes and tables and things like this. These are not aimed at subject constitution, but at capturing and activating pre-subjective and pre-individual elements, effects, emotions, perceptions, to make them function like components or cogs in the semiotic machine of capital. And so what he means um, here is that um, when we're being engaged on, not on the subjective level, but on the pre-subjective level, what Deleuze would call the individual, below the level of the subject. Um, and so just to kind of highlight how this, I think this kind of works, is really that in a basic level, this is being entered into a spreadsheet. So this is the, the just fairly basic spreadsheet for my, for the, the, the program I engaged in at work. You have to enter your data into the spreadsheet. Uh, there was also a kind of a knockout um, cup competition, sort of like a, like a Euro 2016 kind of knockout uh, running alongside it. Um, and if you're encouraged to think about yourself on that level, you can't really argue with it on a subjective level. You're just, you are just that piece of data. I mean, you can argue it in a broader sense, but on that basic level, you, you are just that bit of data. Um, or in terms of like with this map, um, you can't engage with this in any other way. You're, you're either moving towards Rome or you're not. And as with this network, um, this is a kind of form of diagrammatic control. I'm part of this, this network and I'm getting these kind of flows of data coming at me. Um, we control it in a diagrammatic way. The meaning is being controlled um, outside of my, my kind of level of consciousness in a sense. I also did just a, a, another very... Um, basic kind of um, network diagram of uh, the hashtag around the, the GCC, the kind of, uh, Global Corporate Ta Challenge hashtag. And um, basically really all this is showing is that the most influential nodes in this were the official GCC um, 
uh, Twitter feed, Richard Branson, who owns Virgin Pulse and uh, merged with that company, and then a few big employers, uh, a few big banks and kind of councils and things like this. There, it's them that are generating the meaning and the kind of control in the network. As we know, kind of control today doesn't function through hierarchies, it functions through networks, but it's kind of more hidden. Um, and this is what, um, I'm out of time, I'll just be two minutes. Um, what um, Richard Lazzarotto calls um, machinic enslavement, that we're engaged not on the conscious level, but on the kind of pre-conscious level. Um, so again, it's this kind of feedback loop of, of developing a habit, and it's also notions of nudge and gamification, uh, which other people have talked about. Um, but just uh, very briefly, th th I like this explanation of how nudge works. Nudge works if you want to get a mouse from one side of the table to the other, you lift up the table. Um, with gamification, you put a piece of cheese at the other end. So with nudge, you make it, you manipulate the choice architecture to make it easier to run to the other side. Um, the other, you um, put some cheese there, but a little reward. Um, but th that's kind of engaging on that pre-subjective level. It's not engaging you as a, as a kind of a discursive subject. It's engaging you just on this kind of automatic level, this nudging, this just pushing. Um, the, the habitual level. Um, so as Lacharotto says, um, machinic enslavement takes over human beings from the inside on the pre-personal level as well as from the outside on the supra-personal level, kind of the network if you like, by assigning them certain modes of perception and sensibility and manufacturing an unconscious. So it kind of manipulates us on, on, a, on a kind of an almost pre-conscious level, um, pushes us and nudges us into, into being more entrepreneurial, more, con more, uh, more productive, um, and more um, engaged with, uh, in those networks. Um, and that's the, the, the kind of the quote I started with. This is about integrating the living machine um, as much as possible into the productive, um, um, in, into, into kind of the, the capitalist machinery, so the gears don't grind too loudly, so we're smoothly integrated with systems of capitalist production. And um, I won't, I won't go through that Barardi quote, but it's kind of saying a very similar thing. But the last one from Guri and Delay, they say that capitalism tries to appropriate not the means of production, but the, the means of productivity or the inner springs of production, which is our kind of, as I said, our kind of uh, our physical bodies, but also our emotional and our affective lives are kind of appropriated for the, the, the means of uh, capital appropriation in order to um, keep the kind of wheels of productivity uh, going. And that's it. Thank you. Sorry, I ran over slightly.